At the moment, we're here on our own and the public doesn't know about us. But tomorrow you will present us in whatever way you choose, I suppose. But wouldn't you like to see it explode into life as it really is? Yes, of course, of course. There's nothing I'd like more than I can use as much of it as possible. Then persuade my mother to leave. No! No, don't do it! Don't let her do but it! But they're only doing it for me to watch, only for me to see. I can't bear it! I can't bear it! But if it's happened already, I can't see the objection! No! It's happening now as well! It's happening all the time! I'm not acting my suffering, can't you understand that? I'm alive here and now, but I can never forget that terrible moment of agony that repeats itself endlessly and vividly in my mind. <laughs> For any character, his drama is his very raison d'etre. But the mother doesn't even realize that she is a character. She hasn't the slightest suspicion that she is not alive. She is so incapable of stepping outside her role that she doesn't even realize that she has a role. It's as if she is pure nature, fixed in the figure of a mother. The pain that she feels is life itself, which in order to exist has become fixed in our bodies and little by little kills them. The father and the stepdaughter are tortured in the same way, but for them it is a mental torment. For the mother, it is natural. The mind rebels and fights in order to try and gain something from the situation. Nature weeps. <laughs> So there you are. I say, old man, who is mad, you or me? <laughs> of course, I understand. I say it's you, and you say it's me. You, you are mad, no? It's me? Oh, very well, it's me. Have it your own way. Between you and me, we get along very well, don't we? But the trouble is that other people don't think of you as I do. And that being the case, old man, what a fix you're in. As for me, I say that here, right here and now, right in front of you, I can see myself with my own eyes, touch myself with my finger. But what are you for other people? What are you in their eyes? An image. Just an image in a glass. They're all carrying just such a phantom and round inside themselves. And they're all racking their brains about the phantoms in other people. And they think all that is quite all right. The butler enters. In time to catch loudly as he gesticulating at himself in the glass. He wonders if the man is crazy. Finally, he speaks up. <clears throat> Signor Ladizzi, if you please, two ladies calling, sir. And of course you said that everyone was out. I said that you were in. Why, not at all. I'm miles and miles away. Perhaps the fellow they call Laudizi is here. I don't understand, sir. Why, you think the Laudizi they know is the Laudizi I am? Uh, I don't understand, sir. Who are you talking to? Who am I talking to? I thought I was talking to you. Are you really sure the Laudizi you are talking to is the Laudizi the ladies want to see? Why, I think so, sir. They said they were looking for the brother of Signora Agazzi. Ah, in that case, you are right. You are not the brother of Signor Agazzi. No, it's me. Right you are. Tell them I'm in and please show them up, will you? Very good. But we're both in the first act of Henry IV. It's time we changed. Yes? Curtain up in half an hour. Have you seen Mr. Pirandello? Which, Which Mr. Mr. Pirandello? Pirandello. You know, it's just not possible to really live in front of a looking glass. You try looking into the mirror while you're crying about what really grieves you most. Hmm? <laughs> or while you're laughing, because you're wonderfully happy. See? Your tears and laughter will stop abruptly. As a young man, Pirandello had left Sicily to study in Bonn, then settled in Rome. 
but he frequently returned to his prosperous petit bourgeois family in Agrigento. In accordance with Sicilian custom, he entered an arranged marriage with Antonietta Portulano, the daughter of his father's business partner. Although he took her to live with him in Rome, where Pirandello achieved some success as a short story writer and novelist, their income still came mainly from the family sulphur mine. La Zolfara ha avuto grande importanza nella vita di Pirandello per un fatto economico, familiare, sociale e anche sentimentale, direi. Goethe, quando passa per l'altipiano che poi è diventato l'altipiano zolfifero, nota delle messi verdeggianti, dei terreni lavorati con grande cura, con grande pulizia. 50 anni dopo non era più la stessa cosa. Quel paesaggio era diventato arido, secco, bruciato proprio dal fiato dello, dello zolfo in combustione. Le condizioni di vita della zolfara erano allora terribili. Gli operai partivano la mattina all'alba a piedi, facevano parecchi chilometri prima di arrivare alla Zolfara, poi una volta alla Zolfara scendevano a parecchi centinaia di metri sottoterra, dove il caldo era soffocante, lavoravano nudi e non c'era granché di sicurezza nella Zolfara. Le disgrazie, cioè gli incidenti, i disastri, succedevano sempre e spesso con operai morti. E gli esercenti, cioè coloro che gestivano le Zolfare, si arricchivano. E il padre di Pirandello era un imprenditore. Aveva una Zolfara in territorio d'Aragona che ad un certo punto si allagò e fu la rovina per la famiglia di Pirandello perché ingoiò anche la dote della moglie di Pirandello e qui la moglie che era in effetti legata alla sua dote cioè la sua dote, il suo denaro costituiva una specie di, di identità, di forza da, da questo giacollo ebbe un colpo, venne la malattia nervosa, la follia, insomma. Quindi la Zolfara ebbe una grande incidenza sulla vita di Pirandello. From 1903 to 1919, Pirandello and the three children lived in Rome, in the claustrophobic world of his wife's irrational jealousy and worsening paranoia. Dove sei stata tutta la giornata? Che le ragazze di corpo! He was obviously two people. One for himself, another for her. And this other person she saw in him, this sad phantom whose every look, smile, gesture, the very sound of whose voice, the sense of whose words were transformed in her own mind, this other man came to life and lived for her, while he himself no longer existed. In 1919, Pirandello reluctantly had his wife committed to an asylum. Once she had left, my house suddenly seemed empty. She was my nightmare. But she filled the house with her presence. When I was alone, I wandered about like a lost soul in those rooms. I feel that my life is devoid of meaning and I no longer see any reason in the acts I perform or in the words I say. And it astonishes me that other people can move about outside this nightmare of mine, that they can act and speak 